We are all looking for answers in this pandemic. Sweden took a different tack, not shutting down, trusting citizens to follow social distancing on their own, and putting a priority on so-called herd immunity. The idea is to expose as many as possible to the virus. The results were mixed. Special correspondent Malcolm Brabant reports on how the gamble has played out. Sweden was widely criticised for paddling against the worldwide lockdown tide. But now there's a sense of vindication. Around the world, economies are struggling to stay afloat. The Eurozone has shrunk by 12%, but Sweden's hit is less than 9%. As for COVID, Sweden has gone from being one of the most infectious European nations to one of the safest. Right now, we seem to be in a fairly good position. We see a steady decline in the number of critically ill patients and also in deaths since the mid-April. Infectious diseases specialist Anemia Ekstrom thinks Sweden was right to trust people to socially distance. Hard lockdowns are, are unsustainable over any sort of extended period of time in a free society. So unless you find a sort of an acceptable level of restrictions and recommendations that people can understand and support, I don't think you can sustain a lockdown. During April, Sweden suffered more than 100 deaths a day. In all, there have been more than 5,800 Swedish fatalities. Sweden ranks 11th in the world, one place behind the US in terms of deaths per 100,000. Welcome hit. Anders Tegnell runs the Swedish operation. His aim has been to create extensive immunity. He calculated that law-abiding Swedes would follow health guidelines and, as a result, there would only be a soft spread of the virus. The most important development right now is that the infection rates have come down and are continuing to go down. A part of the explanation for that is, in my view, that quite a large part of the population has immunity. Along with other countries, Sweden aimed to ease pressure on its hospitals. Swedish healthcare is one of the best in the world, and it continues to be like that. This local government promotional video paints an idealized portrait of Swedish retirement, but the COVID reality was carnage. 90% of Sweden's fatalities were aged over 70. Half were in nursing homes. Oxygen wasn't provided. Instead, seniors were given morphine to ease the pain of respiratory failure. Yeah, I really do mourn the loss of, of the thousands of people in Sweden who died who might not have done had we had a more um, aggressive strategy towards COVID-19. Professor Paul Franks is an epidemiologist in southern Sweden. Death from COVID-19 is a miserable way to go out. There's no last sort of uh, touch of the skin or quiet words in the ear. Another professor, Yngve Gustafsson, told the newspaper that nursing home deaths amounted to active euthanasia. General practitioner John Tallinger resigned from the Swedish Health Service in protest. What I saw in my inner eye, so to speak, was thousands of people uh, suffocating to death with these instructions that came from the very top. Hey. For Tallinger, this video was the smoking gun. It issued instructions to Swedish care staff. There was no suggestion of sending patients to hospital. Instead, it prescribed morphine and a sedative used in end-of-life palliative care. Tack. The Swedish health care system wasn't overwhelmed because they didn't send anyone to the hospital. They died in their homes at the care homes. What do you think of these claims that the Swedish authorities basically sacrificed people in nursing homes? In March, um, people really didn't know Nobody knew what was happening, right? Um, the world was in disarray. Even the best experts didn't know what was happening. So people really were, at the very best, making educated guesses on how to proceed. And Sweden made its educated guesses. Across the bridge, Denmark imposed a total lockdown early in the pandemic. Thus far, its death rate per 100,000 is a fifth of Sweden's. But in the past few days, its infection rate has risen above Sweden's possibly because Denmark has now tested a third of its 5.6 million population. In a significant reverse, people in the cities of Copenhagen and Uense are being urged to work from home. In the short term, it's pretty clear that we have been sort of going through the first wave in a better sort of public health sense uh, compared to Sweden. Uh, but the jury is still out here. Professor Jens Lundgren is an infectious diseases specialist and he's leading a trial of a drug formulated to fight COVID. 
He has sympathy for Sweden. Danish care homes also suffered. You could be infectious without having symptoms. So therefore, uh, the personnel that comes to, uh, to nursing home, they are potentially the source of infection and brings essentially the infection into the nursing home. And we hadn't thought about that, but it's, it's now abundantly clear that that can happen. And as a consequence, you want to test the personnel before they come in. So I think we're in a much better space now. In Denmark, state figures show that 50% of all infections occurred amongst ethnic minorities, who comprise just 9% of the overall population. Prime Minister Meta Fredriksen. When we look at the numbers in Denmark in a sober manner, there are definitely too many people with a non-Western background who are infected. Of course, we must address this in a decent way, but the numbers have to come out so we can combat the virus. But social worker Uzma Ahmed, a racial equality activist, is worried that ethnic minorities are being stigmatized. People who drive the buses, they are actually blamed for bringing in corona instead of saying, hey, these are the people who are actually working while others are keeping themselves safe. We have a very um, uh, a turned around logic that I would say serves the purpose of finding scapegoats. The authorities say prayer sessions like this, breaching bans on mass gatherings, led to a crackdown in Denmark's second city, Aarhus. Yulun's Post and newspaper also showed a number of crowded Muslim funerals where social distancing was ignored. But aren't there some communities who are just not abiding by social distancing rules? Aarhus is not the only place where it has happened and where the same restrictions are applied. But we don't talk about the restrictions in the other areas as personalised and as something that has to got, got to do with culture. Scandinavia's summer is nearly over. Some experts fear the cold may reinvigorate the virus. Yet both Sweden and Denmark are relatively upbeat. And as Tegnell doesn't expect a second wave. We will have this kind of rather local but rather big outbreaks. Not a complete wave over the country like what we're seeing right now, but rather this localized, smaller or bigger outbreaks in, in different places. It's safe to say uh, that with the ongoing research efforts uh, in a six months time from now, uh, things may actually look, uh, what can I say, uh, potentially even better. At the start of the pandemic, Denmark sealed its border with Sweden because of the perceived risk. But in Covid's volatile new world, the threat has been reversed. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Malcolm Brabant. Fascinating reporting. We thank you, Malcolm.